Did you know that your brain contains more connections than there are stars in the Milky Way? And more connections than leaves in a dense forest? It's a mind-boggling fact that highlights the incredible complexity of our most precious organ. Home to our consciousness and identity, this intricate network is the defining factor that determines who we are. But our brain wasn't always this way. Like everything about us, it has undergone significant evolution over millions of years. So the question today is, what was this evolution like? How long did it take? What changes shaped the brain that makes us who we are today? And why did crying babies play an important role? Whenever we think of the brain, we usually just chalk it up as another part of the body. But the brain is simply so much more. At its simplest, the brain is the equivalent of holding a universe in the palm of your hand. But this is not just any universe, but a universe so intricate and complex that it houses not just the stars of our thoughts, but the very essence of who we are. This universe, however, only weighs about 1.4 kilograms, or roughly 3 pounds, a dense, pulsating network of activity that shapes every moment of our existence. The brain is the most advanced machine in the world. Within this remarkable organ lie around 86 billion neurons, each one a tiny hub of activity buzzing with electrical impulses. But that's not all, as these neurons don't work in isolation. Rather, they're connected by a staggering 100 trillion synapses, forming a network more intricate than any we've ever built. To put it in perspective, there are more connections in your brain than there are leaves in the thickest forests on Earth. It is this vast web of communication that allows us to think, feel, dream, and even create. But how does it all work? Well, the brain's cerebral cortex, that thin wrinkled layer on the surface, is where the magic happens. This part of the brain is responsible for everything from the language we speak to the art we create, from the memories we cherish to even the plans we make. And yet, despite being only a few millimeters thick, it contains about 16 billion of those neurons, each contributing to the complexity of our thoughts and actions. For perspective, no supercomputer in the world is remotely as complex as this. Your brain is so complex that it is the most demanding organ in your body. Although it makes up just 2% of our body weight, this insane organ consumes about 20% of our energy. It's a hungry organ, constantly at work, even when we're at rest, using glucose as its primary fuel to keep our minds sharp and our senses attuned. However, this brain, so vital and so powerful, wasn't always like this. In fact, it evolved much like everything about us, through millions of years of gradual change and adaptation. Today, it is our connection to everything, and understanding this evolution isn't just a scientific pursuit, it's a journey into the heart of what makes us human. So, where does it all begin? Let's go all the way back and start from the top. The story of human cognitive evolution begins with a group of early hominins known as Australopithecans, who lived between approximately 4 million and 2 million years ago. These ancient ancestors are perhaps one of our most important ancestors, as they represent a critical stage in our evolutionary history and bridge the gap between the earlier ape-like ancestors and who we are today. Physically, the Australopithecans are characterized by a blend of ape-like and human-like features. As a nod to human evolution, they had relatively small brains compared to modern humans, with cranial capacities ranging from about 350 to 600 cubic centimeters. These statistics would put their brains closer to those of modern chimpanzees than to those of humans. However, when you pair this up with their skeletal structure, particularly the pelvis and lower limbs, you find something simply amazing. Because their skeletal structure suggests that they were adapted for bipedalism, they could basically walk on two legs. But why is that such a big deal? After all, babies can walk on two legs, and they have about a quarter of the size of an adult brain. Well, it boils down to the fact that bipedalism is a crucial evolutionary development that has had far-reaching consequences for the cognitive evolution of our ancestors. The anatomical changes required for bipedalism, such as the restructuring of the pelvis, the alignment of the spine, and changes in the lower limbs, did something unique. It altered the way early hominins interacted with their environment. 
It was this shift in locomotion that freed our hands for other uses, such as tool manipulation and carrying objects, which in turn could have influenced the development of the brain. As you might already be piecing together by now, the evolution of bipedalism set off a cascade of evolutionary developmental trends that had profound effects on the cognitive evolution of Australopithecans. But what you didn't see coming is that it all ties back down to babies. See, fossil primates combined with comparative studies of modern primates suggests that the evolutionary development trends were closely tied to the development and maturation of infants. But how? Well, first off, the anatomical changes associated with bipedalism led to a delay in the development of posture and locomotion in Australopithecan infants. So, unlike other primates who are quick to develop these abilities, Australopithecan babies likely experienced a slower progression. Now this sounds bad, but this delay meant that infants were less capable of clinging to their mothers independently, leading to significant changes in maternal infant interactions. Essentially, as a result of their delayed physical development, Australopithecan infants began to rely more heavily on their mothers for support and comfort. This dependency in turn led to the emergence of new forms of social signaling, such as evolved ways of crying and seeking attention. These new signals would have prompted more intense and frequent interactions between mothers and their infants, laying the groundwork for complex social behaviors and communication. Yes, complex communication came from crying babies and worried mothers. Think about that the next time you sit in an airplane. Fast forward to around three million years ago, and the Australopithecans began to exhibit an acceleration in brain growth a trend that is actually evident in the fossil record. This early brain spurt, so to speak, marked the beginning of a trajectory towards larger brain sizes and more complex neurological organization. This new growth spurt, which started before birth and continued into the first year of life, allowed for the development of advanced neural networks that would later support higher cognitive functions. This brain spurt is still part of us today. According to research published in the Journal of the American Medical Association of Neurology, newborn brains begin to expand rapidly at the age of two days and reach half their adult size within three months of birth. The increase in brain size among Australopithecans, though modest compared to later hominins, was a significant step in cognitive evolution because as brain size increased, so too did the complexity of neural connections and the reorganization of the brain structure these changes would have then given room for improvements in sensory processing, motor control, and social cognition, all of which are critical components of more advanced cognitive abilities. Today, the fossil record shows that Australopithecan brains were beginning to exhibit traits that would later become more pronounced in the genus Homo. For example, evidence suggests that certain areas of the brain such as the frontal lobe, were undergoing changes that would eventually support more complex behaviors, including tool use, problem solving, and perhaps even rudimentary communication. Once again, thank you crying babies for that. As Australopithecans experienced an increase in brain size, they also faced a significant evolutionary challenge known as the obstetrical dilemma. Huge name aside, this dilemma arises from the conflict between the demands of bipedal locomotion and the need to give birth to infants with larger brains. So essentially, the narrow pelvis required for efficient bipedalism makes childbirth more difficult, particularly as brain size increases. In Australopithecans, this dilemma likely led to a trade-off, where infants were born at a relatively early stage of development, with brain growth continuing rapidly after birth. This extended period of postnatal brain development would have provided a unique opportunity for infants to interact with their environment and caregivers. As such, it would have allowed the fine-tuning of neural connections and the development of more complex cognitive abilities. We keep talking about social interaction and early language, but how big was their role in our evolution? The short answer is that they made all the difference. Now for the long answer. The social interactions between Australopithecan mothers and their infants were crucial in driving cognitive evolution. This is because, as infants relied more on their mothers for support and comfort, they developed new ways of communicating their needs. These early forms of communication may have included vocalizations, 
gestures, and other forms of social signaling that were the precursors to more complex forms of communication, such as motherese and eventually proto-language. By the way, motherese is basically baby talk. The intense reciprocal interaction between mothers and infants likely played a key role in the development of social cognition, empathy, and other higher-order cognitive functions. These interactions would have created a rich environment for learning and neural development, contributing to the cognitive advancements that would later define the genus Homo. But what does that really mean? Well, the cognitive evolution of Australopithecans represents a critical chapter in the story of human evolution. This is because, although their brains were smaller and less complex than those of later hominins, the evolutionary trends that began with them set the stage for the remarkable cognitive abilities that define modern humans. So essentially, the combination of bipedalism, delayed physical development, accelerated brain growth, and intense social interactions created a unique evolutionary environment. This environment favored the development of more complex brains and behaviors, and laid the groundwork for the later emergence of the genus Homo, with its even larger brains and more sophisticated cognitive abilities. Simply put, Australopithecans were the first hominins to exhibit the anatomical and developmental traits that would eventually lead to the evolution of the human brain as we know it today. However, they were just the beginning, because they led to the rise of the Homo species. And that was a whole different ball game. Following the Australopithecans, the next most significant leap in our cognitive evolution occurred with the emergence of the genus Homo. This emergence marked a critical juncture in the evolution of hominin intelligence and behavior. And among the earliest members of this genus are Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis two species that played instrumental roles in the cognitive evolution of early humans. Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis lived between approximately 2.4 and 1.5 million years ago, during the early Pleistocene epoch. They, as you would expect, showed a significant departure from their Australopithecan predecessors with several key anatomical and behavioral characteristics that suggest a marked increase in cognitive abilities. The Homo habilis, often referred to as Handyman, was one of the earliest members of the genus Homo and is characterized by a relatively larger brain size compared to Australopithecans. But that wasn't all, as this hominin quite literally had a trick up their sleeves and could use primitive stone tools. Fossil evidence suggests that Homo habilis had a cranial capacity ranging from about 510 to 600 cubic centimeters which, by the way, is, on average, larger than that of Australopithecans, but still much smaller than that of modern humans. Homo rudolfensis, on the other hand, was a contemporary of Homo habilis and is distinguished by a slightly larger brain, with estimates ranging from 600 to 750 cubic centimeters. Although there is some debate among paleoanthropologists regarding the classification of Homo rudolfensis, it is generally considered to be a separate species from Homo habilis, despite their similarities in time and geography. The increase in brain size observed in both Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis is one of the most notable features of these early hominins. Now the question is, is bigger always better? This increase in cranial capacity suggests an evolutionary trend towards greater cognitive complexity. At its core, it generally means larger brains are generally associated with enhanced cognitive abilities, such as improved problem-solving skills, memory, and social behavior. So maybe it really was about bigger is better. Or was it? For Homo habilis, the increase in brain size likely corresponded with more sophisticated motor skills and manual dexterity. As evidenced by the use of stone tools, these tools classified as older one tools, are the earliest known evidence of tool-making behavior in the hominin lineage. This makes the Homo habilis quite special because the ability to create and use tools is a hallmark of cognitive evolution. This is because it requires not only physical skill, but also the ability to plan, understand cause and effect, and learn from experience. Similarly, Homo rudolfensis likely possessed cognitive abilities that were more advanced than those of their Australopithecan ancestors. For one, the larger brain size of Homo rudolfensis suggests that this species may have been capable of more complex social interactions, as well as more advanced problem-solving abilities. 
However, the precise nature of these cognitive abilities remains a subject of ongoing research and debate. Older one tools, which include simple stone flakes and cores, were likely used for a variety of purposes, including cutting meat, processing plant materials, and perhaps even cracking open a bone or two to access the marrow. It might sound rudimentary, but the ability to use tools allowed Homo habilis to exploit new resources and adapt to a wider range of environments. This in turn may have driven further cognitive development. As mentioned before, the use of tools also suggests that Homo habilis possessed a rudimentary understanding of cause and effect, as well as the ability to plan and execute tasks. These cognitive abilities are foundational to more advanced forms of problem solving and innovation, which would become increasingly important in the evolution of later hominins. Homo rudolfensis, though not as closely associated with specific tool traditions as Homo habilis, likely engaged in similar behaviors. The slightly larger brain size of Homo rudolfensis suggests that this species may have been capable of even more sophisticated tool use, though direct evidence of this is limited. Nevertheless, the cognitive implications of tool use and technological innovation cannot be overstated as they represent a significant step toward the development of more complex cultural behaviors. Much like most hominins, the cognitive advancements of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis were not limited to tool use and might have likely extended to social behaviors and communication as well. But how, you ask? Well, as hominins began to rely more on tools and other forms of technology, they would have needed to develop more complex social structures to facilitate cooperation and the sharing of knowledge. Essentially, the ability to communicate effectively would have been crucial in this context. You do see where we are going with this, right? Good. While there is no direct evidence of language in Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis, their larger brain sizes suggest that they may have possessed the neural capacities required for more sophisticated vocalizations and gestural communication. These early forms of communication would have laid the groundwork for the development of more complex languages by later hominins. This only becomes more possible when you consider the fact that the social structures of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis likely revolved around small cooperative groups. These groups engaged in activities such as hunting, gathering, and toolmaking, and would have needed to communicate effectively to coordinate their efforts, share resources, and protect themselves from predators. Essentially, the cognitive demands of living in such social groups may have driven further brain development, particularly in areas related to social cognition and empathy. The cognitive advancements of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis were not just the result of biological evolution, but rather were also influenced by cultural evolution. As these early hominins developed new tools and social behaviors, they created cultural feedback loops that further enhanced their cognitive abilities. For example, the use of tools likely led to the development of new hunting and gathering strategies, which in turn required more complex planning and cooperation. This would have created a positive feedback loop in which cognitive advancements led to more sophisticated cultural practices, which then drove further cognitive evolution. But that wasn't all, as the cultural evolution of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis also likely involved the transmission of knowledge across generations. Much like today, the ability to teach and learn from others is a key aspect of human cognition. And it is possible that these early hominins engaged in some form of rudimentary teaching and learning. This would have facilitated the accumulation of knowledge and skills over time, leading to more complex cultural behaviors and further cognitive development. At its core, the cognitive advancements of Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis set the stage for the evolution of later hominins and, eventually, Homo sapiens. The increase in brain size, the use of tools, the development of social structures, and the beginnings of cultural evolution were all critical steps in the cognitive evolution of the genus Homo. The advancements made by Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis laid the groundwork for the more complex cognitive abilities that would characterize later hominins. These include the development of more advanced tools, the emergence of language, and the creation of art and symbolic culture, something that the next set of hominins would take and absolutely blow out of proportion. Before moving on to an even larger brain, 
A quick pause. If you're enjoying this journey through the evolution of the brain, take just a second to like this video and subscribe to the channel. More than 97% watch the videos without subscribing. Imagine what we could accomplish if everyone subscribed. It would make all the difference for this channel. Thank you so much. Now, living approximately 1.9 million to around 110,000 years ago was a species that not only showcased the beginning of a significantly larger brain, but also embodied key behavioral and cultural shifts that laid the groundwork for modern human cognition. One of the defining features of Homo erectus was its substantial increase in brain size compared to its predecessors. With an average cranial capacity ranging between 600 and 1,100 cubic centimeters, Homo erectus had a brain size roughly 50% larger than that of Australopithecans and significantly closer in size to modern humans. As we've mentioned multiple times, this increase in brain size is often associated with enhanced cognitive abilities, which are evident in archaeological and fossil records. The skull of Homo erectus also exhibited a more modern appearance, while still retaining some primitive features like a prominent brow ridge and a receding forehead. The cranial shape was also more elongated and less prognathous, which means forward projecting compared to earlier hominins. Now, these changes weren't just aesthetics, as the expanded brain case allowed for the development of larger, more complex brain regions. This was especially true for regions associated with higher order cognitive functions, such as planning, problem solving, and social interaction. If you've been following along, you would expect that the increase in brain size in Homo erectus was a key indicator of cognitive evolution. And you'll be right. Larger brains typically require more energy to maintain, suggesting that the evolutionary pressures favoring an increase in brain size might have been substantial. These pressures likely included the need for more sophisticated problem-solving abilities, enhanced social interactions, and improved communication skills, all of which, by the way, are hallmarks of advanced cognition. Another significant implication of a larger brain is the potential for increased encephalization, this simply refers to the relative size of the brain compared to the rest of the body. The Homo erectus exhibited a higher degree of encephalization than its predecessors, meaning that a greater proportion of its metabolic resources were devoted to the brain, like us. This allocation of energy would have supported the development of more complex neural networks, enabling Homo erectus to engage in more sophisticated behaviors and cognitive processes. Today, Cognitive records provide strong evidence of the cognitive advancements made by Homo erectus, particularly through his use of tools. Homo erectus is closely associated with the Acheulean tool culture, which is characterized by the production of large, bifacially flaked hand axes and cleavers. These tools represent a significant leap in technological complexity, compared to the earlier older one tools used by Homo habilis. The production of Acheulean tools required a higher level of cognitive ability, including the capacity for abstract thought, planning, and the understanding of symmetry and, surprisingly, aesthetics. The standardized shape and design of these tools suggest that Homo erectus had the ability to conceive a final product before beginning the process of toolmaking, which is a cognitive skill known as mental template formation. This ability to plan and execute complex tasks is a clear indication of advanced cognitive functions that were supported by a larger and more complex brain. The widespread distribution of Acheulean tools across Africa, Europe, and Asia suggests that Homo erectus was capable of adapting its toolmaking techniques to different environments. This indicated a level of behavioral flexibility and innovation that would have required sophisticated cognitive abilities. But how about their societies? Well, the increase in brain size in Homo erectus also had significant implications for social structure and communication. This is because larger brains are associated with enhanced social cognition, which includes the ability to understand and predict the behavior of others, form complex social bonds, and engage in cooperative activities. These abilities would have been crucial for Homo erectus, which is believed to have lived in small cooperative groups. Evidence suggests that Homo erectus engaged in more complex forms of communication than its predecessors. While it is unlikely that Homo erectus had a fully developed language, it may have used a proto-language, 
or a sophisticated system of vocalizations and gestures to communicate. The ability to share information, coordinate group activities, and teach others how to make tools would have been crucial for survival and would have driven further cognitive evolution. It is also possible that the social structure of Homo erectus may have also been more complex than that of earlier hominins. There is evidence to suggest that Homo erectus engaged in cooperative hunting and food sharing, behaviors that require a high level of social organization and communication. These activities would have fostered the development of social norms, the division of labor, and possibly even early forms of cultural traditions all of which are important components of human cognition. But all that is trivial when compared to the most significant behavioral innovations associated with Homo erectus. The control and use of fire. See, before we had flamethrowers and fireworks, evidence of controlled fire use by Homo erectus has been found at several archaeological sites, with some dating back as far as one million years ago. Now, this is revolutionary because the use of fire would have provided Homo erectus with numerous survival advantages, including warmth, protection from predators, and the ability to cook food. Cooking in particular is believed to have played a crucial role in the evolution of the human brain, as cooked food is easier to chew and digest, allowing for greater nutrient absorption, and thus providing the energy needed to sustain a larger brain. This nutritional boost would have supported the continued growth and development of the brain in Homo erectus and later hominins. The control of fire also had social and cognitive implications. This is because gathering around a fire would have created opportunities for social interaction, storytelling, and the transmission of knowledge across generations. These activities would have fostered the development of complex social behaviors, language, and cultural practices all of which are integral to human cognition. Another thing that might have had an effect on their evolution is their migration. Homo erectus was the first hominin to migrate out of Africa and colonize a wide range of environments across Europe and Asia. This migration required a high degree of cognitive flexibility and adaptability, as Homo erectus had to develop new strategies for survival in different climates and ecosystems, not to mention the challenges of migration and adaptation would have driven further cognitive evolution, selecting individuals with enhanced problem-solving abilities, social skills, and technological innovation. Another fascinating thought process is the fact that the development of tools, fire use, and other cultural practices would have required the transmission of information from one generation to the next. This process of cultural transmission is a crucial component of human cognition as it allows for the accumulation of knowledge and the development of complex cultural traditions. The cognitive abilities required for cultural transmission, including memory, learning, and teaching, would have been supported by the larger brain size and more complex neural networks of Homo erectus. This ability to learn from others and build upon the knowledge of previous generations is a defining feature of human cognition and one that began to take shape during the time of Homo erectus. So, how did this primitive brain send men to the moon? Well, the answer lies in the next hominin. So far, we've covered a good number of hominins and looked at how they helped get us to where we are today. But perhaps one of the most lasting evolutionary traits came from two of our closest evolutionary relatives that we haven't spoken of, the Neanderthals and Homo heidelbergensis. These hominins were important branches in the evolutionary tree and their cognitive evolution quite literally translated to the sophisticated minds we have today. Homo heidelbergensis, which lived approximately 600,000 to 200,000 years ago, is often considered the common ancestor of both Neanderthals and modern humans. These hominins were widely dispersed across Africa, Europe, and possibly Asia, adapting to diverse environments and laying the groundwork for cognitive developments that would characterize their descendants. With a cranial capacity ranging from 1,100 to 1,400 cubic centimeters, Homo heidelbergensis possessed a brain size comparable to that of modern humans, though their brain structure was somewhat different. Their increased brain size relative to earlier hominins like Australopithecans suggests a significant leap in cognitive abilities, particularly in areas related to problem-solving, 
social interaction, and tool use. Like the Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis is associated with the Acheulean stone tool industry, characterized by large bifacial tools, such as hand axes and cleavers. These tools required not only manual dexterity, but also advanced planning and understanding of material properties. Archaeological evidence also suggests that Homo heidelbergensis lived in social groups, which would have necessitated some form of communication, possibly including gestures, vocalizations, and rudimentary language. The ability to work together to hunt large game, build shelters, and care for group members would have required advanced social cognition, which is a precursor to the more complex social structures seen in Neanderthals and modern humans. Speaking of Neanderthal, they lived from approximately 400,000 to 40,000 years ago and were one of the most successful hominin species outside of our own. They evolved from populations of Homo heidelbergensis that migrated into Europe and Western Asia and over time adapted to the harsh, fluctuating climates of the Pleistocene. As they did, they developed a unique set of physical and cognitive traits that allowed them to thrive in environments where others might have struggled. Here's the shocking part. Neanderthals had brains that were, on average, slightly larger than those of modern humans, with cranial capacities ranging from 1,200 to 1,750 cubic centimeters. However, before you start saying they were smarter, you should know that the structure of the Neanderthal brain was different with a larger occipital lobe, which is associated with visual processing. This suggests that Neanderthals may have had superior visual abilities, possibly as an adaptation to the low-light environments of Ice Age Europe. The larger brain size of Neanderthals does not necessarily mean that they were more intelligent than modern humans, but it does indicate that they had advanced cognitive abilities. These abilities were likely tailored to their specific environment, emphasizing spatial awareness, memory, and perhaps even a form of symbolic thought. When it comes to tools, Neanderthals are closely associated with the Mousterian tool culture, which was a serious advancement over the Oshelian tools used by Homo heidelbergensis. The Mousterian toolkit included a variety of specialized tools, such as scrapers, points, and blades, which were often made using the Lavalua technique. The Lavalois technique is a stone tool-making method from the Middle Paleolithic era, where prehistoric humans prepared a stone core to produce uniformly shaped flakes. This method allowed for more efficient and standardized tools, advancing early human technology and planning. The complexity of Neanderthal tools indicates to us a high level of cognitive function, including the ability to plan, learn from experience, and pass on knowledge within a group. The existence of diverse tool types also suggests that Neanderthals were capable of adapting their technology to different tasks and environments, which would suggest they had advanced cognitive flexibility. Within the society, Neanderthals exhibited social behaviors that suggest a deepening of cognitive and emotional capacities. For example, we have evidence today that they cared for the elderly and injured. Besides sounding humane, this indicates a level of empathy and social responsibility within the species. But that's not all, as the discovery of possible burial sites and the inclusion of grave goods suggest that Neanderthals may have had some form of ritualistic behavior, which could imply a rudimentary belief system or an understanding of life and death. It would surprise you to know that Neanderthals, in particular, left a lasting legacy in our own species. In fact, Genetic evidence shows that modern humans interbred with Neanderthals, and as a result, most people of non-African descent carry a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA. Some of these genes are associated with traits such as immunity, skin pigmentation, and even cognitive functions. Homo heidelbergensis, on the other hand, is equally significant for its role as a transitional species. The cognitive and behavioral developments of Homo heidelbergensis laid the groundwork for the later cognitive evolution of both Neanderthals and modern humans. Their ability to adapt to a variety of environments, use complex tools, and form social groups set the stage for the emergence of more advanced cognitive abilities, including language, abstract thinking, and cultural expression. Essentially, they were the chicken, we were the egg, assuming you think the chicken came first. Let us know in the comments which came first. Finally, as we reach the pinnacle of our evolutionary journey, 
we find ourselves face to face with a species we know all too well. Homo sapiens, or us modern humans. Our journey, spanning tens of thousands of years, is proof of the amazing cognitive capacities that distinguish us from all other living forms. From the invention of the first tools to the landing on the moon, our species' accomplishments are simply a reflection of the culmination of millions of years of evolution, characterized by inventiveness, adaptability, and unquenchable curiosity. Unlike our evolutionary cousins, whose cognitive capabilities were advanced, but ultimately limited by their environment and physical constraints, Homo sapiens broke through these barriers. Against all odds, or because of them, we developed a level of cognitive complexity that is unparalleled in the history of life on Earth. Our ability to think abstractly, communicate through complex language, create art, and manipulate our environment has allowed us to become the dominant species on the planet. But why? Well, the cognitive evolution of Homo sapiens was shaped by a combination of environmental pressures and genetic changes. See, as our ancestors migrated out of Africa and spread across the globe, they encountered a vast array of environments, from the frigid tundras of Europe to the dense rainforests of Southeast Asia. These diverse environments imposed different survival challenges, which in turn drove the evolution of various cognitive adaptations. This adaptation was our greatest strength. This is because the ability of Homo sapiens to adapt to different climates and landscapes required not only physical changes, but also significant cognitive advancements. For instance, surviving in colder climates necessitated the development of sophisticated clothing, shelter, and fire-making techniques, while warmer climates needed something completely different. These innovations ultimately required advanced problem-solving skills, planning, and social cooperation. A good example is the sheer harshness of the Ice Age. This time period likely played a role in honing our ancestors' abilities to work together, share resources, and communicate effectively, skills that are central to modern human societies. But that wasn't all, as on a genetic level, several key mutations are believed to have contributed to the cognitive leap that distinguishes Homo sapiens from other hominins. One of the most significant of these is the FOXP2 gene, which is associated with language and speech. Astonishingly, variations in this gene appear to have given Homo sapiens a unique ability to develop and use complex language. This, in turn, became a crucial tool for social bonding, cultural transmission, and problem solving. But it gets even crazier, as changes in the HR1 gene, which is involved in brain development, may have played a role in the expansion of the neocortex. This region is the part of the brain responsible for higher order thinking, such as reasoning, abstract thought, and self-awareness. As such, this expansion allowed for the development of more intricate neural networks, enhancing our capacity for memory, learning, and creative thinking. But how did all these happen in such a relatively short period? As we've seen so far, the evolution of human cognition is a complex and multifaceted process. But what we haven't talked about is the fact that this evolution has been the subject of various theories and models. One of the most influential theories is the social brain hypothesis, which posits that the demands of living in large complex social groups drove the evolution of our brains. According to this theory, as our ancestors began to live in larger groups, they needed more advanced cognitive abilities to navigate social hierarchies, form alliances, and engage in cooperative behaviors. This social complexity is thought to have led to the expansion of the neocortex, enabling more sophisticated social cognition, such as the theory of mind, which is the ability to understand the thoughts and intentions of others. Moving on to another theory, closely related to the social brain hypothesis, is the cultural brain hypothesis, which suggests that the transmission of culture plays a crucial role in cognitive evolution. According to this theory, as humans develop the ability to learn from one another and pass down knowledge across generations, this cultural transmission created a feedback loop that drove further cognitive development. Essentially, the more complex our culture became, the more cognitive capacity was required to learn, understand, and contribute to it. This in turn led to the evolution of brains capable of processing and creating culture, including language, art, and technology. 
And if you think about it, a good example is how today's jobs require a higher level of intellectual power than jobs from, say, early Greece. The match of technology matches our cognitive growth with it. In fact, the human brain has nearly quadrupled in size in the six million years since our species last shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Researchers at UC Davis Health even discovered that human brains are growing bigger. Study participants born in the 1970s had 6.6% bigger brain volumes and nearly 15% more brain surface area than those born in the 1930s. The mean volume of Homo sapiens, according to some research, has even grown from 1,330 milliliters to 1,440 milliliters. Another key theory is the expensive tissue hypothesis, which argues that the large size of the human brain is metabolically costly, requiring a significant amount of energy to function. According to this hypothesis, the evolution of a larger brain was made possible by changes in diet, specifically the shift to a diet rich in animal protein and fat, which provided the necessary energy to support brain growth. This dietary shift may have been accompanied by a reduction in the size of the digestive tract, allowing more energy to be allocated to brain development. In the end, the result was a brain capable of supporting the complex cognitive abilities that define modern humans. One of the most fascinating theories is by far the Baldwin effect. This theory is a concept that bridges the gap between cultural and biological evolution. It suggests that learned behaviors can influence genetic evolution by creating selective pressures. For instance, if a certain behavior such as toolmaking or language use provides a significant survival advantage, individuals who are better at learning and performing this behavior are more likely to survive and reproduce. Over time, the genes that support these abilities become more prevalent in the population, leading to biological changes that reinforce the behavior. Essentially, it's the cognitive survival of the fittest. So what does the future now hold for human cognitive evolution? When we look into the future, the question arises, what lies ahead for human cognitive evolution? While the forces that shaped our brains in the past continue to influence us, new factors are emerging that could drive future changes in our cognitive abilities. One of the most significant drivers of future cognitive evolution is likely to be technology. As we develop increasingly sophisticated tools such as artificial intelligence, brain-computer interfaces, and genetic engineering, these technologies have the potential to enhance our cognitive abilities in ways that were previously unimaginable. For example, brain-computer interfaces could allow for direct communication between the brain and digital devices, effectively augmenting human intelligence. Similarly, advances in genetic engineering could enable us to modify our cognitive traits, potentially leading to the emergence of a new form of human intelligence. But technology is not everything, as environmental and social changes will continue to shape our cognitive evolution. As we face new challenges such as climate change, global pandemics, and the need for sustainable living, our cognitive abilities will be tested in unprecedented ways. These challenges may drive the evolution of new cognitive traits, such as advanced problem-solving skills, greater adaptability, and maybe even improved social cooperation. It all sounds good, but the future of human cognitive evolution is not without ethical considerations. Exploring the possibilities of cognitive enhancement and genetic modification, we are left to grapple with questions about what it means to be human and where the boundaries of our cognitive evolution should lie. While the potential for enhancing human cognition is exciting, it also raises concerns about inequality, loss of identity, and the unintended consequences of tampering with the human brain. Moreover, the biological constraints that have shaped our cognitive evolution in the past, such as the obstetrical dilemma, which limits brain size due to childbirth constraints, continue to impose limits on how much our brains can change. As a result, future cognitive evolution may focus less on physical changes and more on the reorganization of neural networks, the development of new cognitive strategies and the integration of technology with our biological systems. Although it might not be okay, due to a lack of physical radical changes, the journey of human cognitive evolution is far from over. In fact, it's only going to get more interesting, both biologically 
and culturally, as our brains adapt to meet the demands of an ever-changing world. However, regardless of what the future holds, we will carry forward the legacy of our ancestors, holding the torch of the early hominins who first began to walk on two legs, fashion tools from stone, and explore the depths of their own minds. The future of human cognition is a story that is still being written, and it is up to us to shape the next chapter. But what do you think? How much do we owe to our ancestors? What do you think humans will be like in a hundred years? And do you think you have some Neanderthal DNA in you? Let us know in the comments. While you're at it, why not hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn all about the wonders of prehistoric times. If you'd like to dive further into our evolution and our ancestors, check out this video or this one, or check the links to find which piques your interest. Until next time, stay curious.